Okay, good evening. Good evening. Welcome to Bible study, Genesis chapter 1, which we're doing in week 2. Why? Because it takes a long time. Because it takes a long time is not the right answer, Herman. What? What? Because it came after. Because it came after chapter 2 and 3. Chapter 2 and 3, the Yahwehist creation story, is older than the poem that shows up in Genesis chapter 1. And so today we're going to look at that poem, and I'm encouraging you to consider it as a poem, because that's how it was written. Just as I said, when you're reading the newspaper, it's important to know what point in the newspaper you are at, because you don't read the business section the same way that you read the editorials, or the funnies, or the classified, or the obits. We know what genre is, but we often don't apply that to the Bible. And we really ought to, because we're missing it. So often, this thing that happens, this poem that's written in Genesis chapter 1, is used inappropriately. It's used as a scientific treatise, as if it were in a science textbook. There are people who have actually um, uh, tried to make this part of a science textbook. That's completely inappropriate, right? Uh, as much as I love Walt Whitman, it doesn't need to be in a science textbook. As much as I love Shakespeare, it doesn't need to be in a science textbook. Uh, the, the proper use of what we're reading today is poetry, ancient, beautiful poetry, that classifies and imagines God in a really powerful and wonderful way. So, we're going to need to shake up what we've been doing, with the way we've been thinking about it, in order for us to imagine it the way it was supposed to be written, which is actually a better way. So what I'm hoping to get across to you today is to erase, right, to erase some of that theology and, and write some new theology on top of it that's actually the original Jewish or Hebrew way of looking at this. Now this block of three classes, we did one last week on Adam and Eve, we're doing this one on creation, and next week we're going to do Adam and Eve in a new way. So we spent most of the last time erasing the old way, right? What was the old way of looking at Adam and Eve? The fall of sin, right? The original sin with the apple and Adam and Eve who are proper names um, and the serpent who actually represents Satan. None of that is in the text. Does this sound weird to you? It's starting to sound like I can't hear me anymore. But you can hear me? Okay, good. None of that's in the text. That's a Christian way of reading Genesis chapters 2 and 3 in order to create the problem that Jesus solves. Okay? We started reading it that way so that Jesus could solve the problem. And when we read Jesus as already having solved the problem, we can gloss over all that stuff he tells us to do. Right? Because then we're just reading Jesus as the Christ, who's a problem solver, and boom, we no longer have to take care of the orphan and the widow because we're focused our theology on Christ solving the problem. Well, Genesis chapter 3 doesn't have that problem in it. So we spent most of our time last week finishing that way of looking at it. So originally, we've had this idea in our head that we are simultaneously saint and sinner. Put another way, and in Genesis, we are, we are made in the image of God, which is clearly good. There is only one way to read that poem in Genesis chapter 1. Original sin is not there. Clearly good. Clearly. And this thing that we've read into Genesis chapters 2 and 3 called original sin. That's not in the text. This text is a Hebrew text. That's not the way our Jewish sisters and brothers read this text. And this text belongs to them and not us. Uh, so now we are, we are left with being made in the image of God. And we're going to shake up some of our preconceived notions about what it means to be made in the image of God, right? We all know this kind of artwork, but we're going to start fresh. And what was this about? I showed you this last week. The sandwich, the bookmarks. The sandwich, the bookmarks, yep. Uh, this motion is called anvil, by the way, in case you're wondering what the PowerPoint or the keynote thing is that makes it fall and shake. I like that one. 
Um, we tend to tell the story this way. We tend to tell the story of the Bible uh, through the lens of what we think Jesus is here to solve. And we leave out creation, which is Genesis 1, that says everything's good. And we leave out Revelation, starting with chapters 21, really, especially, where the Lamb of God takes away all that is wrong with the world. And we are left with a new Jerusalem. Right? We're not, this isn't a Bible study in Revelation, but if we did a Bible study in Revelation, you would not like it, because it does not say what you think it says. The end of Revelation ends with a new Jerusalem. Does it end it with the end of the world? No. Say no. no. Is the end of the world anywhere in Revelation? No. no. There's a fight, there's a battle, and at the end of the battle, there's a new Jerusalem. There's a new place in which God can dwell. Uh, so the, the, the Bible is really a story of creation and new creation. This is why uh, this thing happens so much in our churches where Jesus represents a new creation. That creation isn't something that's static, that started a long time ago, and uh, when God rested, nothing new happened. But creation is ongoing, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So I've encouraged you to look at the Bible a bit more like this. Creation, redemption, and restoration. Okay. One of my professors in seminary is a, was a famous uh, theologian, if you're into this specific kind of theology. His name is Dr. Ted Peters, and this is what he says. Nothing was created all at once. Everything, including human beings, is on the way, so to speak. Furthermore... As Earth's system continues to take in energy from the sun, we can expect still more creative activity in the future. Creation is ongoing. So just the, even though God rested on the seventh day and it was good, creation continues. I said, how many of you watched my Facebook video from yesterday, the four minute video from yesterday? Right? I, I said this yesterday, God spoke everything into existence, and on the seventh day, he stopped speaking so he could listen. Right? God continues to listen and enjoy the sounds of creation. Uh, there are a lot of studies out there about how being in nature, being with the earth, camping, listening to birds, watching things grow, petting a cat can add years to your life. I don't know if you've read this study, but that is a legitimate scientific study that has happened, right? We are supposed to be one with nature. We're supposed to be with the earth from which we came. Uh, and that's a really beautiful message of creation and new creation. But remember that creation is ongoing. Okay, I've said that enough. There was a movie that came out a, f a few years ago, maybe three years ago now. It was called Noah, and it starred Russell Crowe, and it was completely inaccurate. It had, nine, it had two hours and 98 minutes of complete, terrible, unwatchable theater. But one two-minute segment where he explains the story of Genesis chapter 1. So. So what do you think of that? Theater major doesn't like theatrics. <laughs> what? We're bad. We, we destroyed everything. We destroyed everything. Okay. All right, so, we out, so I think something we can hear from this that's going to be all throughout Genesis is that we're really on the cusp of civilization for the first time. And you've got people who've never had to answer for their actions before, and you've started to give them laws, like the Code of Hammurabi, like the Ten Commandments, and there's a lot of pushback on that. There's a, it's hard to enforce laws um, when people are used to being barbaric. Um, what else did you see in here that you liked or didn't like? Yeah. You liked that the people were portrayed as originally as beings of light because light was spoken into existence and they were there. I find it incredibly hilarious 
that you see this evolutionary progression all the way from the creation of the earth and fish and then the fish come to land and they're kind of this ugly reptile and then it becomes like this mongoose looking thing that turns into uh, a chimpanzee and then it cuts to black and then it shows people. Did you see that? Yeah. Why do you think they did it that way? Because there would be a riot on their hands. Right? The people who made the, the Noah movie had to know their audience. And what would their audience have said? I'm fine if you want to show some evolution, but don't you dare tell me that I came from a monkey. <laughs> don't you think that's true? I haven't looked that up. But don't you think that's exactly what happened there? Yeah, so we, we, have, to, we have to bifurcate. At some point, we're utterly convinced that, that uh, if we want to talk about evolution, that we, we should probably leave that part out because none of us wants to be um, convinced that we are from chimpanzees or something like that. I find that really interesting. But I also find it beautiful that for the most part, you can look at Genesis chapter 1 and the uh, events that unfolded since the Big Bang, and they, they, it kind of worked. I think it worked better than I thought I was expecting it to. What was your reaction? It was really beautifully done. Very, very, there was some great cinematography there. Yeah, uh, so it's not bad. It's not bad. It's not far off. Um, I would still encourage you to read it as a poem, because it is. Do you feel the cadence of it? In the beginning, God did this, and there was evening and morning the first day. And then God did this, and there was evening and morning the second day. That's poetry in motion. That's, there's a rhythm to it. <clears throat> and <clears throat> we're not even reading it in its original language. It's been translated many a time by the time it gets to English which people who study romance languages will tell you English is not very romantic, right? It doesn't follow the same iambic pentameter that so many of the other love languages do so, so well. Um, so it's a beautiful poem that I thought comes across pretty well. Okay, we're going to set aside our creation story and we're going to look at a couple of them that also happen around the same time. Now, these next couple videos that I'm gonna show you um, are not of the same quality as the one that you saw, but I think they, they're really gonna get this point across to you. So, I wouldn't show you these videos unless I thought it was important. So, see if you can follow along with this. Let's give a hand for Nathan. This is not his job, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, Nathan. I texted him today, I'm like, you're coming to Bible study, right? Because I sort of need you. <laughs> so we're going to look at two of them. We're going to look at an Egyptian one. So if you, if you imagine that Jerusalem is here, Egypt is here, and the other one is Canaanite, which is up here. So it's very close by. Okay, so Egypt is this one right here, or at least that's where it's showing up here. This one's the Old Testament one, which we're not going to watch for, for sake of time. And then up here we're going to go to Canaanite. Okay, so you know there's a, there's a, this is about where they, I'm sorry, we're going to watch Babylonian, and then we're going to talk about Canaanite. Before we do that, though, tell me what you saw in the Egyptian one. What interested you? Separating light and dark. Separation of light and dark. And chaos. Chaos, yep. Yeah. What's that? The sun had to die and be reborn. Lots of different gods, yeah. Uh, how was the sun created? Yeah, she gave birth to it every day. Yeah. So that's interesting that, the, that labor pain was part of Genesis chapter 3, right? and also showed up here in this Egyptian one. That's not something you would think of, but we're talking about creation, right? <clears throat> Why was the sky and the land separated? Okay, but they were lovers, right? 
and uh, the god of wind made them have to separate, okay? So there's a little bit of star-crossed lovers thing going on. That also means that we live awkwardly in between the world of two lovers who are longing for each other. That's sort of an interesting motif. But they were told to separate because they had jobs to do, right? Um, I, th I think that there's probably a story there that people are trying to tell lovebirds, hey, somebody's got to go out in the fields, right? <laughs> Y'all could kiss each other later, but, you know, uh, yeah, that creation story's there, okay? Um, there were a multiplicity of gods. Does that surprise you at all? Polytheism? Lots of gods? No? But there was one main god, wasn't there? What was his name? Atom, A-T-O-M. Does that sound like any name that you've heard of? Yeah, yeah. I wonder if we could trace the etymology, which we really can't, if we would find a relationship between those two. But they seem very close, don't they? Anything else from the Egyptian one that I missed? Oh, how were people created? Okay. <laughs> I love how he creates himself out of his own thoughts, right? That's very uh, Cartesian, don't you think, right? <laughs> he creates himself out of his own thoughts, and then he creates his son by spitting, yeah. spitting, and creates his daughter by vomiting. vomiting. I'm not sure which one I would rather be, to be honest. Dad loves me more. Uh, and then from there, we get uh, these other gods, and it's when the two children who were lost return home, because Atum, with his all-seeing eye, return, found them, okay? So Atum, the father god, is um, omniscious, right? Can see everywhere, but, but only one place at a time, right? Wherever his one eye is. And then he creates people out of his tears. So that's kind of interesting, don't you think? Um, he's got some, uh, some magical salivary glands and, uh, and uh, eye, eye ducts. Yeah, okay. Anything else on this one? All right, listen. What did you notice about the Babylonian story? You can go back to the PowerPoint now. Thanks. Creation, military style. Creation, what? Military style. Uh, military style. Yeah. Yes. Yes. There was a lot of war involved. The heavens and the earth were not two lovers. They were two different parts of a disemboweled dragon. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's better, to be honest. Yeah. That was interesting. What else did you see? Violence. Where, where did life come from originally? Two seas. One was fresh water and one was salt water. I think that's pretty beautiful, don't you? That's very clever. I remember taking a, a trip in middle school down to the marsh, right, uh, in Wilmington. Anybody else go on that trip? Yeah? And you could like, you went, yeah, not as a child, but you went. And you could, like, you could see that that's an estuary, that stuff grows there that doesn't grow in other places. Periwinkle snails and all that. So that's kind of a cool idea, that I think, that they came up with. Yeah, what else? What's that? Man was made to work. People were made for one purpose, to serve the gods. I think that's about what we expect to see in a creation story, don't you? I mean, we know about stories that are much later than this. We know about Greco-Roman kind of stories. You know about those, right? Uh, and those are all about people serving the gods and being punished by the gods and stuff like that. Monotheism? Yeah. Or polytheism? Um, the, the god breathed life into the people. Yes. Marduk breathed life into the people. Uh, and he started with bones from what? The monsters, the monsters that he killed. Yeah. yeah. And then he put some, uh, meat, some f it said flesh on there. That'd be interesting to look up how he found flesh. Uh, and went to the store and bought some. And then he breathed life into it. Yes, yes. Where did he find the chariot? 
where did he find the chariot? I, I love that he uh, also invents a bow and arrow, um, and I love that he destroys the dragon with uh, a lightning bolt out of a bow and arrow. That's very clever, don't you think? In terms of uh, literary critique of its day, I think that's pretty clever. It also suggests that people with bow and arrows exist, right, by this time, okay? And chariots, right? And horses that have been tamed, okay? So you're starting to pick up some of that culture that's been there. You're, you're becoming um, historians and archaeologists as we go through this, all right? But it also suggests that war is the way in which humans are created, okay? Yeah? Isn't that the part of the world where they had the cult of Baal? Yes. Yes, and so did the Jewish people, right? That wasn't Jewish just... people did that? Yeah, that's in Scripture as well. Um, so where's that? Child sacrifice, the story of Abraham. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Randy? Yeah, yeah. but on that, uh, Baal, B-A-A-L, sometimes called Baal, is also from this same general region. We don't have the map up anymore. Uh, that's, uh, that's a Canaanite thing, which we're going to get to, not Baal and specifically, but the Canaanite religion too. Yeah, Randy. How old are these stories Yeah, um, uh, they're, a, they're around the same time, right? If they were here, they would pitch a fit about that, right? Because they're probably 200 years off. But they're both older than uh, especially the poem. They're probably uh, in the same century or give or take of the Adam and Eve story. Did you notice there were snakes in this one? Yes, I did. And dragons, yes. yeah? And did, when you saw that, did you think, oh, that's Satan? No, you just saw that those are snakes and dragons, right? Because that's, that's what they're supposed to be. And there was a Sphinx and uh, Scorpion Man. I, I liked that one. Yeah, I wanted to see that one. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. One thing that has dropped in on me, I, I may be jumping the gun on this, but I noticed they, right, they had the multiple gods in both stories. Both stories were polytheistic. And, yes. And in our version, or the Hebrew version, it, 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 the God says, created our Yes, we're going to get there. You are ahead of me. Okay, um, here's just some notes that I came up with uh, about the Egyptian, which was the first one, giving birth every day. Um, that's not great. Um, all of this, it was all trying to overcome chaos, which makes a lot of sense when you're trying to overcome chaos in your life, that that's what creation was meant to do. Try to get people to settle down to where they have they're not in chaos quite so much. Babylonians, we got a lot of this. Um, there's a preference in a lot of these, and we just sampled them. There, there are many more creation stories, even from this area. Even from this area, Samaritan and Canaanite and uh, uh, many others that are all kind of like that. But I wanted to give you the, I gave you the two big ones, right? I gave you New York and L.A., right? <laughs> Egypt and Babylon, uh, but we could have gone to all the other little tribes, too, and you would have seen a lot of the same themes. And one of those is a preference for the younger generation. Why? They wrote the story. Okay, that sounds like you talking. That doesn't sound like them talking. Yeah. What? They wrote, the they wrote the story. Ding, 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 ding. You ever wonder why we have the same story in Exodus that's in Deuteronomy? There are very similar books. Have you ever noticed that? Do you notice that the Ten Commandments shows up in Exodus 20 and also Deuteronomy 5 and they don't agree on what the ten are? Have you noticed that before? We Lutherans, by the way, like the Deuteronomy one. That's because they were written by different generations. Okay? One generation writes the story of Exodus and the next generation comes on and they're like... Psh. Mom and dad are off their rocker, and they write their whole story their own way, okay? This is a world in which people are starting to live a couple of generations long. Think about that. That didn't happen before in the, quite the same way, okay? So people are actually living to become grandparents, right? And there's just some, some suggestion that the reason our species survived is because we had wisdom. Because there were some people who were like, honey, I... You're pregnant and there's going to be a baby and I, I can get ready for you because I've been there, right? You see how that's a kind of a better life? You say yes? yes. 
Yeah, if there's somebody who's been through what you've been through before. But what happens after that's happened for you know a few millennia is that the young up already, right? I don't need you running my life, okay? So the longer people live into their lives, the longer that they're around in their children's lives, which helps their children survive longer, which makes history and civilization have more institutional memory, which means we don't repeat the same mistakes over time, but eventually we get to a place where people live longer than they are strong, right? You probably, maybe some of you can't bench press what you could have bench pressed, right, uh, earlier in your life. Uh, if you were building a house, you, you might not be able to be physically as dominant as you were uh, then. My dad keeps telling me that he's getting too old to play basketball with me, and I just refuse to believe it, right? Um, but you can see why out of that comes a narrative where this big, strong, hulking Marduk guy comes and he kills his mother. Did you see that? Right? I mean, Tiamat, the, the swirling sea thing, was the beginning, right? Interesting, nobody said that there's a female at the beginning. That's interesting, isn't it? That's a different tale than we've heard. But Marduk kills them. Why? Because he's stronger. Because he's better at war. And then he becomes the sun. And he creates the stars. He takes credit for everything. Right? Because there's nobody around to claim otherwise. Right? You always wondered how you, somebody proves that they're 120. Have you thought about this before? Right? <laughs> there's nobody around to corroborate anymore. Uh, you could just, you know, if you live long enough, you could say you're as old as you are. I don't know. Yeah, that's right. Uh, okay, so... So a few generations later, Marduk becomes this preference for the younger generation, and that shows up again and again. All right, a couple of other things. Um, we're not, we don't have a video for the Canaanites, but you need to know about the Canaanites. Do you remember what the land of Canaan was in reference to? The land of milk and honey. The, the milk and honey, do those grow on trees? No. You only get milk and honey if you have a civilization, right? Say yes. yes. Yeah. They don't, you don't just, they, there is no such thing as a land of milk and honey. There are civilizations in which you can produce milk and honey. Do you, do you see the difference there? Which means by the time the Hebrew people get out of slavery and they get to the land of milk and honey, there are already what? People living there, right? There's already a civilization. Those people are the Canaanites. The Canaanites have been there longer than the Hebrew people. They intermarry. They, they live in the land. There are, there are stories like the story of Joshua where they destroy the city of Ur. There's no historical reference that that city ever existed. What's likely is they escaped slavery, they got into the land, and they married the people in the land. That's what you do when you get there and there's already people there, especially if you're going to call it the land of milk and honey. So this story becomes very important because if you've got mom is a Hebrew and dad is a Canaanite and then two generations down you probably get a little fuzzy about whose story is whose right say yes yes yeah uh, we really don't know our ancestry pretty very well it's, it's kind of one of these things that gets overlooked but um, a lot of people in a lot of other parts of the world have to memorize their ancestry. Uh, in the Muslim faith, they memorize their ancestry. And they can go a lot further back than we can, uh, which is a little scary. Somebody read this. Out loud. <laughs> go ahead, Coleman. In the midst of the water, and God's made a dome in the midst of the waters. They divided the waters above from the waters below, declaring heaven and earth as their own. And at El's command, the waters fled. They fled from above the mountains, and dry land appeared. What creation story is this? It's the Canaanites. Because of El. And you know that El is Canaanite. Yeah, right. But what does it also sound just like? 
our creation story. It sounds just like uh, Genesis chapter 1. Yeah. So L, the story of creation, sounds just like that. And uh, this one, who was back here? Who was reading back here? Go ahead, read this one. Okay, that's also a Canaanite creation story. You think that might have seeped into the pages of Genesis chapter 1 and 2? Yeah, just a little bit. Un poquito, as we would say. So this is, it begs the question, doesn't it? The God that shows up in Genesis chapter 1 is Elohim. The God of the Canaanite gods is El. Are they one and the same? Probably. Yeah. Okay, so we've got these three creation stories that, I gave, that I've given you now, Egyptian, Babylonian, and Canaanite. And let's look at how they compare to the Hebrew one, because um, I'm of the opinion, and this is not a scholarly opinion, this is not something that I've read. I try to tell you when it's just my opinion, that I don't always get there, but most of the time. I'm of the opinion that the Hebrew God is phenomenally more evolved and it's a more interesting and beautiful creation story than the ones that we've looked at so far. I'm of the opinion that this is an evolved, God-breathed, inspired theology that we have going on in Genesis chapter 1. So this is what we got from the other ones. A multiplicity of gods. Um, epic battles because of temper tantrums often. Uh, gods not behaving very godlike. Begotten instead of created. What's the difference there? Begotten is of yourself, of the same substance, right? Uh, beginning of Matthew, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so, okay? Uh, creation is when you create something that's not you, that's apart from you. Do, you, do you, we understand the difference in that? Yeah? Uh, you create a science project. Unless you dripped blood onto it, you didn't beget the science project, right? Uh, okay. There's a preference for the younger generation. Creation is out of accident or afterthought. And there's sexual tension and or violence in every, every other story that we've read so far. How does that compare to the story that's in Genesis chapter 1? Oops. It looks like there's a oneness. Um, it looks like there's a monotheism that happens here in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God. Okay? We're going we're gonna to parse that out. That's why I put an asterisk there, right? Because uh, I've had some pastor friends look at my videos uh, and tell me what I did wrong. People on the video, I put an asterisk there uh, next to the oneness um, <clears throat> because I think... I think there really is a, a greater sense of monotheism here in Genesis. Have you ever felt like it was polytheistic, Genesis chapter 1? It really doesn't quite read that way. Did we kill the projector? We just had a blink. We had a power surge? Well, it's a good thing I have notes in front of me. Oh, wait, I don't. <laughs> So there's a, a oneness to the God of the Hebrew Bible. There's a oneness. There's a monotheism. There's a one God there. And it's not creation out of violence. And it's not creation on accident. It's not begetting. It's not from tears. It's not from violence. It's out of goodness. It's ultimately a story of creation out of benevolence. It's a story about creation out of love and joy and happiness. And he says it at every turn. He says it is good every single time he gets a chance to. Not it happened on accident. Not I destroyed all the world and then I created people to show people how great I am. It was strictly a benevolent love, a sacrificial love, a love of otherness, not even of his own form, not even of God's own begotten. He creates something other just to love it. 
I find that divinely inspired. How about you? And there's a Sabbath. There's a poem here. And then there's a Sabbath. There's a day in which God rests, which I've already told you, I believe, is because God spoke creation into existence for six days out of love. And then on the seventh day, God listened to the symphony that God had created. I just find that so beautiful. I could keep saying this, but I'd be saying the same thing over and over again because it's just that beautiful. And I hope when you put your head on your pillow tonight, you would just imagine a God who would create you just to love you, just so that you would be there to love. Gosh, I think that's so great. One more thing. Okay, maybe two more things. What does this mean? Image of God. What does the image of God mean? Okay, some people think, she couched it by saying some people think, right? Uh, asking for a friend, right? Some people think that it means that we look like God. That's bogus, right? It's how he imagined us. It's how God imagined us. So, the, so out of the imagination of God, you're suggesting. That's, that's new. That's interesting. I haven't heard that before either. I kind of dig that. The imagination of God. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? Surely you've thought about this. The ability to love. The ability to love, Tom says. Yeah. Well, right. Especially based off of the idea that creation was so God could love us. There's certainly a sense that uh, being made in the image of God, as in Genesis chapter 1, is to be good. Right? God says over and over again, He created it and it was good. It seems like that quality, whatever the goodness is, it seems like that love or joy or grace or goodness, that to me seems like what the image is. Now, I just want to show you what's actually true about this text, okay? And I love to use Wikipedia in my Bible studies uh, for a lot of reasons. One, so you know that I didn't make this up. Two, so that... What? Somebody else did. Somebody else did, <laughs> right? Um, two, to, for you to know how common this view is, okay? Not, not only did I not make it up, I didn't hear it from some esoteric professor somewhere, right? This is a common idea. Wikipedia has been tr proven to be as reliable as any encyclopedia that's ever been printed, by the way. Um, whether, you, whether you trust Wikipedia on the whole, um, I'm just suggesting to you that uh, this is a pretty understood view of what's happening when we are cr actually created in the image of God. Let us, so this is what God says, let us, which is a plural, make, the word to make here is plural, okay? Uh, man, or humans, in our plural image, our image, after our plural likeness. So the Hebrew words are? All plural. plural. All plural. Okay, so think about that. God is plural, and His creation God's creation is also plural, okay? So many people who've actually studied this have suggested that to be made in the image of God isn't a one. It's a plural. It's a community. Being made in the image of God is community. Yeah, Tom? What is, what is it in the Hebrew? What is what in the Hebrew? Plural and Hebrew? Yes. That's what, that's what this is saying. So up here... Um, all I did was make bigger what's, what I actually found uh, on Wikipedia, which confirms everything in every seminary textbook I read, and what's in my red annotated Bible. Yeah, Peggy. Have anything to do with the Trinity? Um, that's a great question. That's a great question. There, there are a lot of reasons why I think this text, this poem, has some really divinely God-breathed, beautiful language in it. My question back to you would be, does it need to have the understanding of Trinity to be onto something? Do you know what I mean? 
Trinity isn't something that somebody has thought of yet. Um, remember, I keep saying, theology is not for God. God knows what God is. Theology is for us to understand God. But isn't it true in the fiber of our being that God cannot be just a, a oneness, but God instinctively has to be relationship. God has to be energy. God has to be more than oneness because in a larger sense, we are invited into God. Ted Peters, my professor, says that when you talk about Trinity, we're not talking about points on a triangle. We're talking about the area of the triangle. That's what God is. Not three points, but the land in between, the relationship, the energy, the flow, the movement. So is it naming Trinity? Clearly not. They don't have that word. But are they on to something? You betcha. Well, if... Holy sugar. Yeah. <laughs> yes. The same wording is, is, uh, is in where he says, let's, let's, let us go and take care of this problem at the Tower of Babylon, right? Um, I haven't looked at that recently, but this source, the, the Elohim source, the E source in the, in the documentary hypothesis would be consistent on that. So if that's the E source that shows up uh, at the Tower of Babel, I wouldn't be surprised uh, if, if it's a let us. Well, if you've read that, yeah. If, if something is everywhere, isn't it almost by de definition plural? Even if it's only one thing? If something is everywhere, isn't it by definition plural? I don't know. <laughs> if God is everywhere and he's a connection to everyone, yeah. right. there's a multiplicity in that. Even if there's not another God, right? You could have a singular God who yeah. has a multiple relationship thing. And that's, I can right. see how that plurality is there. So, so theologically, I, I am with you. If you're asking me if I think they're with you, I don't think they are. I'm going to tell you what I think they mean, which is a little bit off the mark, but I still think that there's beauty in the fact that I think they're on to something. Okay? That's what I'm trying to tell you here. Let's go ahead and finish this up. Okay, for a long time, we had known that El had this wife. And her name was Asherah. And then way on down the line. So we always wondered if Elohim was also considered to be married to Asherah. And then we found this piece of a potsherd, this piece of archaeology, which is now in the Louvre, that suggests that Asherah was later married to Yahweh. I know, it's a soap opera, right? Yeah. <laughs> These, like sand through the hourglass, so are the days of the Hebrew lives. Okay, so there's, there's always been, now hear me on this, before they go to Babylon, which is about 568, okay, for about 400 years, we're going to call these people Hebrews consistently. They are not Jews. They do not call themselves Jews until about 100 years before Jesus. The Hebrew people are polytheistic. Because the world is. No one has ever imagined that there's only one God. That is not a thing. They might even say our God, which they say a lot, over and against their God. If you read Exodus and Deuteronomy, they're con constantly telling people to tear down the Asherah poles, which are the ancient temples of who? Asherah. And guess who prays to the Asherah poles? Women. Why? Because the men are ruining their lives. <laughs> men are convinced utterly and completely that God is a dude who put them in charge. Okay? Women needed something to pray to that meant equality and stability. And they didn't know what else to do unless it were a woman. And they had married into Canaanite civilization. They're, they're in the land of Cana. And the, the Canaanites have this goddess whose name is Asherah, who's the goddess of fertility, who's the goddess of love and, man, and family and children and harmony. And they say, I need that. So, we don't have any idea actually what the plurality is in Genesis chapter 1. We don't have any proof of that. 
We do know is that El and Elohim are very synonymous. We do know that El was married to Asherah. We do know that the language is plural in every ounce of Genesis chapter 1 about what God is. It's a very, it's a very familiar cosmic kind of God. It sounds a lot like a parent. The word father doesn't show up. The word father doesn't show up. Find the word father in Genesis chapter 1. It's not there. But there's a benevolent creator. And I'm suggesting to you, that sounds a lot more like a woman than it does like a man to me. A person who's willing to take part of their own life, take time out of their own life to create something else just to love it. Just to watch it grow and develop and tell it every day that that's good? That sounds a lot like a woman to me. Maybe your experience has been different. But the story sounds an awful lot like, like the people who wrote it had some balance to it. Somebody with access to power who knew how to create things and also some balance of the willingness and desire and want to just love something else. We do know that Yahweh was later married to Asherah. So uh, it seems pretty logical, by the way, in case you're wondering, uh, this one is Yahweh here. I uh, wonder what that is that they drew. Uh, and uh, this uh, is Asherah over here. Yeah. I, So it could be that being made in the image of God was the image of a husband and a wife. That could actually be on the pages of Genesis chapter 1. Or another way to say that is that the plurality of Genesis chapter 1 is at least consistent with the notion that God is more than just one being, but God is a trinity or an energy why stop at three, right? God is an energy, a flow, a movement of life and joy, and it was good. Um, I, I've pitched this before, and uh, I, I have had one feminist critique of my feminist critique of this text, which was that uh, God, the Creator, takes the seventh day off, and we don't know any women who actually do that. Um, so I, I can hear that. Uh, I, I can hear that as, a, as a, a, a suitable critique of what I'm suggesting to you today. Why not the third alternative that, as you said, the, all the other civilizations were polytheistic. Why not assume that the Hebrews, not the Jewish people, the Hebrews were polytheistic. He's asking, why not assume that they're polytheistic? Yeah, yeah, they, they are polytheistic, but they've made a concerted effort to make sure that whatever it is is unified. Do you see that? They don't mention two gods by name. Not, e not even trying to. Not even close. There's no chaos. There's no division. There's no lovers who can't be together. There's no warring, which takes two beings that are otherness. There's a oneness to it. There's a, there's a unity to it. So there's a plural, but it's together. That's what's so, that's what's so ahead of its time. Right? What? All, and it's all good. And it's all good. Yeah, that's right. Was there Sabbath in any of the other stories? No. Now, Sabbath is a, is a very Jewish thing. Um, we're over time, but I'll just say quickly, uh, the, the reason for Sabbath is because they become farmers. And when you're a farmer, you can till the land and grow things for six years, but then you have to let the land lay rest on the Sabbath, on the seventh year. That's a true thing. That comes from years of practice of trying to till the earth. So then some priests say, 
God made the land, God made us from the land. If the land is supposed to rest on seven, then we should also rest on seven, which is where we get the word sabbatical, where pastors are supposed to take one out of every seven years off. Uh, and uh, Fred's giving me the nah. Uh, <laughs> Pastor Wolfgang and I were both noting that we started in the same year, which is really unfortunate <laughs> for the guy who came second. Yeah. <laughs> either way, either way, we, we must agree, I, I'm, I'm compelled to say we must agree that to be made in the imago dei is to be made in community, in a plurality, in a relationship. We cannot stand alone, worse, we cannot stand opposed, we must stand together. And people who've read this thing seriously over the years have, are utterly convinced that this is what it means to be in the creation. This is what it means to be made in the image of God is to stand together and in community. And there's one guy that I bet you've heard of who would use this phrase an awful lot, and he got his name from Martin Luther. <laughs> Martin Luther King Jr. knew his Hebrew. I call him Pastor King, and I encourage you to too. I don't know why people call him doctor and they don't call him reverend. Was there a moment in his life when he wasn't a reverend in doing this movement? He was a pastor the whole way, baby. The, the last words out of his mouth were picking the hymns that he was going to sing that night. He was a pastor through and through, and a good one. And he knew his Hebrew, and he knew that to be made in the image of God was to be made together. And so he takes that, and it becomes the centerpiece of what he calls the beloved community, which is imagining that the future is calling us back to harmony with God. The future is calling us to stand together as equals, and that is what is good about creation, is when we are actually together. All right, so uh, Dr. Ted Peters likes to call it the divine bowler. The divine bowler is like this. In the beginning, God took six steps and he let that ball go. And that ball is headed somewhere. But it's not there yet. Now God may be resting. But creation is ongoing. It continues down the lane. And it's headed towards something. And our job as Christians in this world is to figure out what God wants us to go toward and make it happen. We are called, as Martin Luther would say, to be co-creators with God in a new creation. That we are called to continue into the future. And Ted Peters would take it even a step further than that. God creates, he says, then from the future. The bowling ball has not yet reached what it was meant to do. The throw wasn't what it was meant to be. It was meant to be the strike. We are on a path. God is not pushing us from behind. God is calling us from the future of books yet unwritten. So all of this talk about is it true, is the creation poem true, is it historical, does it need to be in textbooks, I would say, let us wrap our minds around being made in the image of God together and let us build something that would make God, who's listening, proud to hear it. That's all I have for you this evening. Have a great night. Thank you all, and thanks for the band. <laughs>